Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. In the last video I talked about simultaneous language acquisition, children acquiring several languages at the same time as their first languages. In this video we'll focus on successive language acquisition, so what happens when you learn a second language on top of a first language that is already in place. How is that different in terms of the process of learning, in terms of the environments in which learning takes place, and also with regard to the outcomes of learning. So when you think about pronunciation, grammar, lexical elements that you're using. So how is all of that different across simultaneous and successive language learning? If you want to, you can pause the video here, take out a piece of paper, take a few notes of your own thoughts about this, um, and then come back to this video. So I'm going to continue right now. Um, the ideas that I'll discuss in this video come from chapter 7 of Grosjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. And there are mainly three issues that we need to talk about. The first issue is age. And this, you could say, is the basic difference between simultaneous and successive language learning. At what point after birth does the language learner encounter the new language? Is it directly after birth? Is it a few years after birth? Is it at some point later in life? And in this context, we need to talk about something that's called the critical period hypothesis. That's a term that many of you will probably know. Okay, we'll also discuss sounds. How do L2 learners acquire the sounds of a second language. So most L2 learners actually retain an accent of their native language when they speak um, a second language. So you can tell what native language someone has. And um, we might wonder, why is that? Why don't they just sound like everybody else? And what is the role of age in this context? Then we'll also talk about cross-linguistic influence. I've already mentioned in earlier videos that there's transfer from the L1 to the L2 with regard to syntax and lexical choice. But as we will see, there's also influence the other way around from the L2 to the L1. So if you've spent a lot of time in an L2 environment, this can actually influence your L1 and change the way you use words in your native language. Right, so let's get to work and talk about age and the critical period hypothesis. The critical period hypothesis, in a nutshell, says that there is a window of opportunity for human beings to learn languages easily and effortlessly. And there are controversial aspects to this, and there are not so controversial aspects to this. What's not controversial is that, well, yes, young children learn the first language much more easily and much more successfully than adults who try their hand at learning a second language. So if you take a baby and place it in any kind of linguistic environment, that baby will pick up the ambient language and sound just like any other native speaker, so it will be indistinguishable uh, from that point of view. If you try the same thing with me, let's say you drop me off on some tropical island and then you check back 10 years later, I hopefully will have learned the language, but the other guys will still make fun of me and say, oh, Martin, he sounds a little funny. Yeah, he never really learned the language. So, well, that's that. Um, so that is not controversial. What's more controversial is to think of the critical period hypothesis as a discrete and um, categorical window of opportunity for human beings to learn a language. And so some Researchers make a categorical distinction between language acquisition, the kind of thing that babies do, and language learning, the, the kind of thing that adult language learners do. And uh, the claim is that, well, there are different processes at work. This seems to be questionable. So the idea that I will defend in this video is that uh, language acquisition and language learning actually draw on the same mechanisms, but for adults, there are things that get in the way that somehow inhibit uh, processes of language learning that make it harder for you to achieve the same outcome. So we'll talk about this. <clears throat> um, I said that, well, it's uncontroversial that there's a difference between babies and adult language learners. What explains these differences? There are early studies focusing on biological reasons. So, for instance, brain maturation plays a role as you grow up, um, as you learn things, your brain matures. There are connections that are lost, that are pruned. Um, that sounds like a disadvantage, but actually it's an advantage. It makes your brain more efficient at the things that it does, but it also incurs the cost of less flexibility. Um, there's also brain lateralization. So for most speakers, 
language is associated with areas in the left hemisphere, and this gradually uh, develops over the first years of life. Um, so this undoubtedly plays a role. Biology is important. However, um, later research has shown that biological reasons are by no means the only factors that play a role. So also social factors are heavily implicated in the differences between early language learning and late language learning. For instance, um, here's an early study of native speakers of English learning Dutch in the Netherlands for one year. And there are four groups, as you can see, uh, children aged 3 to 5, 6 to 7, 8 to 10, and then 12 to 15. And the critical period hypothesis would predict that, well, as you get older, language learning gets harder, and at some point there is a cutoff point, and there we should really see a drop. Now, uh, the results show something different, namely the teenagers, the oldest group, they make the biggest progress of the four groups. This is not predicted by the um, critical period hypothesis, but if you think about this, there's actually a logical social explanation for this. Namely, uh, younger children spend a lot of time in the context of their families, where presumably they hear a lot of English, and the teenagers, well, they don't, they don't actually care for their parents. They want to spend as much time as possible outside of the house and hang out with their friends, who, of course, speak Dutch. Yeah? So they have a strong motivation to learn Dutch. They have become acculturated to the Dutch environment. And um, so this means that they are in a position where they actually reap the greatest benefits from the environment that they are in. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another study by Johnson and Newport, who studied Chinese and Korean L2 speakers of English and checked how well they know English grammar. So these are speakers living in the United States, and the crucial variable was how soon did these speakers arrive in the United States. Some arrived at a very early age, three years, some arrived as adults, so that went up to 39 years of age, and um, that was the crucial variable that was investigated. Other variables that were included in the analysis were the duration of the stay in the United States, so how long were people exposed to English as the ambient language, but also how strongly were they motivated to learn English. So what were their motivations with regard to uh, English as a language and how closely were they acculturated to English? Did they have friends? What did they think about English uh, speaking culture in general? Yeah? Did they like to keep to themselves and their Chinese or Korean diaspora or did they uh, mingle with people who had been living in the US for longer times. Yeah? It turned out that there was a difference between early arrivers and late arrivers. So early arrivers were people uh, that came to the US before the age of 16 years. And for them, it turned out that duration of residence mattered a lot. So duration of residence was a good predictor of how well they could speak English. For the late arrivers, duration of residence was not a significant predictor of L2 competence. Yeah? So if you've come as an adult, then it's not the length of exposure to the language, then it's something else, namely how motivated are you to learn the language and what do you feel about the ambient culture? Does this seem foreign and intimidating and strange to you? Or is it something that you feel good about and say, yeah, I want to be part of this. I want to hang out with you guys. Let's do something. And uh, as a result, you learn the language. Yeah. So this means that the um, critical period hypothesis needs to be modified in at least two ways. Uh, the first is that, well, there isn't really a sharp cutoff date at which language learning abilities rapidly decline. It's much more of a continuum. Yeah, it happens gradually. And secondly, there are large individual differences in language learning abilities after age 16. And these are largely explained in terms of cultural factors like motivation and acculturation. How close do you feel to the language that you're supposed to learn? Yeah. Do you feel good about that language? Mm, it goes without saying that also cognitive skills play a role. Yeah? So how analytic a person are you? Are you able to figure out grammatical patterns of the new language? Are you able to hear the sounds of the new language? Not everybody uh, does this to the same extent and with the same success. So cognitive skills play a role. And finally, also your personality plays a role. Are you a very uh, introverted person? Do you like to keep to yourself? Or do you want to hang out and uh, spend time with other people? Yeah, so people 
who like to, who are outgoing, they, they typically have an easier time learning a new language. Right, another factor that explains differences between early and late language learning has been um, put forward as a hypothesis that's called the less is more hypothesis. So this is about children who have less, but which turns out to be more with regard to language learning. So young children have limited cognitive capacities with regard to their attention span. So you can't sit them down and you know, have them read a book for one hour that, that won't work. Uh, they have a limited ability to hold multiple things in memory at the same time. And they have a limited ability to link concrete experiences to more abstract generalization. And um, for, well, in, in a scenario where you're a university student, that would be a severe disadvantage, but it turns out that for children who learn language, it's an advantage because children don't overthink the data. That is, they keep to the surface, they memorize words and phrases that they hear, and they engage in gradual piecemeal learning. And this is very important for early language learning. <clears throat> um, if you're interested in this, I can point you to other videos on my channel where I discuss the work of Mike Tomasello and Elena Lieven and talk about first language acquisition. So if you're interested in that, you'll find those videos uh, on my channel. Right. Um, <clears throat> another topic that we need to talk about is entrenchment. As you become more proficient in your L1, uh, the representation of that L1 in the brain becomes more and more resistant to change. That is, your knowledge of language becomes more entrenched. Um, children have a relatively greater plasticity of their knowledge representation. That means when they are faced with new data that contradicts an earlier generalization that they have made, children are more ready to give up on a generalization that they have made. So they, they are open towards changing their mind yeah, about some aspect of grammatical structure. And this also turns out to be a big advantage. The upside of entrenchment is that you're routinized, things happen more efficiently, things happen more reliably, more quickly. But when you're learning new things, entrenchment is actually a bad thing. Yeah? So then it is fixed and it's hard to change. And this is one parameter uh, that explains the difference between early and late language learning. <clears throat> uh, I need to mention McWinney's unified competition model. Um, when I discussed the critical period hypothesis, I said that, well, both L1 and L2 learning are not fundamentally different, but they draw on the same mechanisms. But with L2 learners, there are things that get in the way. These things that get in the way are called risk factors by McWinney. And there are things like negative transfer from the L1. So you adopt structures from the L1, project them into the L2, but they don't really work in the L2. Yeah. So let's say that um, <clears throat> as a speaker of German, you know that uh, word order in subordinate clauses is sometimes different than word order in main clauses. And so you think other languages need to do this in the same way. And you produce a funny word order in English subordinate clauses and native speakers go like, what are you saying? Yeah. So that's negative transfer. Um, another uh, uh, Another aspect is what I just talked about in terms of entrenchment. So as an older speaker, uh, you have less elasticity, less flexibility, because much of your language knowledge is actually strongly entrenched. And then lastly, there is the social distance between L2 learners and native speakers that may sometimes get into, in the way of L2 learning. If you feel uncomfortable in the presence of you know, other speakers in the new language environment, then that actually hinders successful acquisition of the L2. Okay, risk factors as one element that explains the differences between early and late language learning. Um, that's it for that for now. Let's move on to sounds. How do L2 learners acquire the sounds of a second language? Now, as I said, adult L2 learners typically retain an accent even after many years of training and even when they are very, very proficient with regard to grammar and they know all the words, you can talk to them about quantum mechanics, about politics, about whatnot, but they retain their L1 accent. Why is that? Yeah. Um, well, the explanation is that learning your first language includes learning an inventory of sounds that you tune into. Yeah. 
last in the last video we talked about children starting out as linguistic citizens of the world and after a while they become culture bound listeners so this is this yeah so you are a culture bound listener so you you have learned to recognize sound differences that matter in your language and you have learned to ignore sound differences that do not distinguish between different meanings in your language yeah so again this is a trade off it makes recognizing words of your native language easy but it makes recognizing different words in another language hard. Yeah? Okay, so as an L2 learner, you have gone through years of trained ignorance when it comes to these foreign sounds, and this puts you at a great disadvantage. In a way, you're, you're overtrained, and it's hard to unlearn these things that you've been practicing for so long. Um, learning L2 sounds is, of course, easiest when each phoneme of the L2 maps onto a phoneme of the L1, but, well, this is rarely the case. Yeah? So here I've shown you two vowel spaces, uh, English vowels and German vowels, and of course, um, so the English A is not quite the same as the German A, but it's close enough. Yeah? So, and there is an English E and a German E, and so they map onto each other fairly well. <clears throat> okay, so speakers can find out about these correspondences and that makes things relatively easy to learn. However, what do speakers do when there's a phoneme that is simply not there in the L1? So imagine you're a speaker of English and you know you learn German and uh, well in German there are words such as müde which means tired and müde has this U sound, so uh, high front rounded vowel U, and um, well, it's not really there in English. Yeah. So and well, how do you pronounce that? Yeah. Do you improvise a little bit and then try to mimic it? Do you pick a sound that is similar enough? Yeah. Muda. You could, but that's not quite not quite right. Um, there are studies that investigate what sounds are particularly hard to learn, and they've shown that the easiest sounds are sounds that directly correspond to L1 sounds, unsurprisingly so. Um, what's harder are sounds without correspondences, like the U in German. Um, so here speakers note as well, I don't have this, I have to make something up to, you know, uh, to, to emulate this. But the hardest sounds are really sounds that are relatively close to existing sounds in your own language, but they don't match exactly. Yeah? So this is really difficult because there you're trained to hear two sounds as the same thing, but in this other language, they actually signify different sounds. Yeah? So that there are different phonemes. Sounds that are perceptually more dissimilar to L1 sounds are salient, they're easy to learn. Sounds that are perceptually very similar, uh, they are very hard to learn. So we'll uh, look at a study that investigated this in Japanese learners of English. And a common paradigm in this is a, a, called a triplet test. So a triplet test asks you uh, which sound is different. We have three, uh, two are the same, and one is the odd man out. Yeah? Let me try and play this. So the first sound here is Ra, wa, ra. Okay, so we have two ra's and one wa. That means you should press on this one. Okay, this is the one that is different. <clears throat> okay, mm, now what was done in the study was that speakers heard pairs of sounds and they had to decide is this the same or is this different? You know, which one is this odd man out? And what you see here is a matrix that shows how often two sounds were distinguished in a triplet set test. So how often were they seen as being different? Uh, and you see that very, so uh, pairs like sa and ra, they were distinguished 100% of the time. They're clearly different to the Japanese learners of English, but there are sound pairs where the Japanese learners of English are not so sure. And notably we have la and ra where well, you know, basically uh, there was a 50-50 chance of speakers hearing this as different or as the same. And that's, of course, because la and ra actually fall within to the same phoneme category in Japanese. <clears throat> Here you see the, uh, the results. Uh, there were actually several groups. So there was a control group of native English speakers and, well, reassuringly, 
uh, they are at ceiling for the distinction between Ra and La and also the distinction between Ra and Wa. So there are black circles and, and uh, white circles. The black circles are native English speaker adults. The white circles are the children. And you see there's no difference between the English uh, adults and children. All of them here, Ra versus La, just fine. The same for Ra and Wa. What's different uh, is in the Japanese children and adults. So this experiment was done twice. Yeah, time one uh, occurred one year earlier than time two. So uh, at time two, the Japanese learners had undergone one year of training in English. And you see that at time one, the Japanese children are really, really poor when it comes to distinguishing Ra and La. Yeah, so they're the, the, the worst here. Uh, less than chance, actually. But after a year, they've improved a lot. Yeah, so one year of training in Japanese children makes a big difference. They're not quite at ceiling. They don't behave like English native speakers, but they very much outperform the adults. The adults, they also make progress, but not as much. Yeah? What this means is that as an adult, you have a harder time learning, tuning into the sound difference in another language, and it becomes harder and harder the later you start learning the second language. So here we see the distinction between Ra and Wa, and also there we see a huge increase for the children and a sort of moderate, very little increase for the adult learners. This shows the same thing. The older you get, the harder it becomes to learn a sound difference in an L2. So Japanese children and adults find it difficult to distinguish Ra and La, Ra and Wa. Uh, children get much better over time. Adults, hmm, not so much. Uh, if you compare the two, Ra versus Wa is less difficult than Ra versus La. And uh, that's because there's a greater perceptual distance between Ra and Wa. Ra and La, they belong to the same phonemic category in Japanese. Okay, um, now here's another experiment that uses a different paradigm, namely a distance estimation test. So in a distance estimation test, you hear two things and you're being asked, okay, how similar or different are these two? On a scale of one, they're the same, to four, they're totally different. How different are these sound pairs? And so sometimes you hear, uh, let me play this, saf, and then you hear sof. sof. Yeah, and there you go. Well, those are totally different, four. And then one time you hear Saf, Saf and uh, the researchers try to trick you and then play another Saf. Saf, and there you have to say, well, those are the same. Yeah, So you can't really say they're, they're not all different, some are the same, some are different, and you have to make decisions, and there are different vowels at play. So uh, let me play this one here. Saf. Saf. Okay, this is Saf, and this is Saf. Saf. So there are different sounds, but quite similar, yeah. Uh, let's play this here. Saf. Saf, yeah. Here are the respective phonemes. <clears throat> and people were asked, um, how different are they? The researchers recorded several variants. So not all Safs were actually identical. There were no different speakers saying Saf and the same speaker is saying Saf on different occasions, it always sounds a little different. And also there you have to decide, okay, is this the same sound or is this a different sound? And that makes it yeah, less than trivial. It's, it's not trivial. Um, here's what the monolingual speakers did. Uh, reassuringly, they knew their phonemes, yeah, so they could distinguish between a eh and o oh and e eh and a. Ah. And what you also notice is that these clusters are really compact and neat and compressed. So even though the different recordings of a eh were different, speakers still said that, well, these are the same. Yeah, I hear them as the same. And that's what you do as a native speaker of a language. You hear different realizations of uh, a given phoneme. And even though the realizations may be quite different, you still hear them as the same. This is called categorical perception. And uh, we, we see this in the responses of the monolinguals. A clear, crisp distinction of the four phonemes and all the clusters are nice and tight. So let's look at what the bilinguals 
did. Here we have results from early bilinguals who are highly proficient. So these are bilinguals that learned English, started to learn English early in their lives, and lo and behold, the results are not that different from the monolinguals. What you could say maybe is that the clusters are not as tight, not as neat, yeah, so here there were two us where people said, well, this actually sounds quite different from these other ah that I've just heard. Yeah, uh, but on the whole, the discrimination between the four morphemes, uh, phonemes, uh, works really well. Yeah. <clears throat> If we compare this to early bilinguals who then became low in proficiency, so they didn't advance as much as the other group, we see that there's actually, well, greater dispersion of the individual phonemes, so the clusters are no longer as nice and tight as with the monolinguals. And also there's some overlap creeping in between a and o. Yeah? Those are adjacent in the vowel space, but nonetheless, um, the monolinguals hear them as clearly distinct the early bilinguals, low proficiency, not so much. There's some overlap there. Okay, uh, on this slide, this is what you've just seen, these two panels here. Here are intermediate bilinguals, bilinguals that learned, uh, that started to learn English later. And again, high proficiency seems to make for relatively reliable discrimination. So all the S form a nice little group, all the S form a nice little group, so the S are, are actually nicely clustered, except for this guy here. Uh, but with A and O, again, we see some kind of overlap. Yeah? So discrimination is still good, but not perfect, and certainly worse than with the early bilingual high proficiency speakers. Now here, with the intermediate bilinguals who are low in proficiency, we actually just see a big blob. Uh, so, yes, there will be some kind of signal. There is discrimination. It's not like the phonemes are all over the place, but you see that uh, the discrimination is a lot worse than with the other groups. <clears throat> and here we have late bilinguals, and you see that the problems only increase. Always there is a difference between high proficiency and low proficiency, so the high proficiency guys, they uh, outperform the low proficiency speakers, but, uh, well, look at this. This looks like a mess. Yeah, so what this goes to show is that as you grow older, it becomes harder and harder and harder to distinguish the sounds of a foreign language. Right, so native-like performance in speech perception is only found in early bilinguals with high proficiency. However, the early bilinguals started their L2 around age 3, and that's later than the babies that turned from linguistic citizens of the world into culture-bound listeners. So there is hope. Yeah, You can distinguish, you can acquire the phonemic system of a foreign language, but you better do it early. And proficiency plays a role. Speech perception is more native-like in high-proficiency L2 speakers, both across early and late bilinguals. Right, last topic for today, um, cross-linguistic influence and specifically transfer not from the L1 to the L2, but the other way around. Is this possible? We know that the L1 has a large effect on processing and production of the L2, but is there also an effect in the opposite direction? Um, let's say you are you're spending a long time in an L2 environment, you use the L2 extensively. Does this change the way you use your L1? It seems that yes, this actually happens. And here we have a study by Pavlenko and Malt, who studied Russian learners of English and had them name pictures of household items. So here you see three pictures, and if you want to, you know, pause this video, uh, decide what you would call these. Um, I know what I would call these. Yeah, so the first one is a glass, a wine glass, if you want to be specific. The second one is a mug. Looks a bit like a travel mug, you know, one of these things that you can uh, take with you, and there's probably a lid on it. I can't really see it well. And the last is a cup, a uh, small thing to drink tea, if you like that beverage. Um, so glass, mug, and cup, and that's what I would call this. And, um, well, the participants were also asked to rate their own confidence in these uh, names. So I'd be 100% confident for glass. For the mug, well, I don't know. It's, it's not a great mug. It's just this travel mug. And so there I'd be less confident. But with the cup, I would be 100% confident that this is actually a cup. 
Right. Um, so the participants of Palenko and Malt were Russian learners of English, and they had to indicate names in English and in Russian, and they had to indicate their confidence. So when we look at um, item 43 here, so here uh, the participant said, okay, this is a cup, 90% uh, confident, and this is also called a stakan in Russian, and there people were 100% confident. <clears throat> um, this is also a cup, this is also a cup, this is also a cup. Um, and uh, these three were called stakan, and this, well, in Russian, this is called a chashka, not a stakan. So it seems to me, I'm, I'm learning Russian here as I go, uh, so apparently a chashka needs a handle and a stakan doesn't have a handle. Yeah, so here we have another stakan, no handle, another stakan, no handle, another stakan, oh shoot, that one has a handle. So, well, I have to revise my hypothesis, but you know, this is how the um, experiment goes. Uh, here we have uh, another set of, of chashkas, so, well, they, they all have, well, this one is a chashka, but doesn't have a handle. So maybe it's something about the size. So what you see is that uh, these categories of what is a cup and a mug and a glass, they depend on different characteristics of the thing. And in Russian and in English, these characteristics may be different. Yeah, so there's, there's no way of telling a priori uh, what these categories should be. They don't match exactly, but they overlap in funny ways. So um, the question for the experiment was, will ratings differ between monolingual Russians and Russians who've been using English for a long time? So as uh, a speaker of Russian who has much experience with English, well, you've heard uh, people talk about glasses and mugs and cups, and these words have translational equivalents in Russian. Uh, do you use these equivalents in ways that reflect your English categories, or do you use them in the way that you've learned them initially as a Russian L1 speaker? So here we have three uh, stimuli, three items. We have this, this large beer glass, uh, another glass, looks like a pint, and something that looks like a wine glass. And so the native English uh, control group, they call this glass. You know, all three of them are glasses uh, with a lot of confidence. And let's look at, 40, uh, at 53 first. So uh, this is a stakan for early bilinguals. It's a stakan for childhood bilinguals. For the late bilinguals, it's a bokal. Yeah? And for the native Russians, it's also a bokal. Mm -hmm. um, 47 is a glass for the English speakers, a stakan for early bilinguals, a stakan for childhood bilinguals, a stakan for late bilinguals. Native Russians call it a bokal. Yeah? And then 50, the wine glass, it's a glass for the native English speakers, a stakan for the early bilinguals. Childhood bilinguals call it a bokal. Late bilinguals call it a bokal, and of course the Russians call it a bokal. So a bokal seems to be like a fancy glass, so if it has a little stem and is meant for something like wine, then it's definitely a bokal. And if it's sort of borderline fancy like this, it's, 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 it's also a bokal. Right. Uh, now, if we look at the early bilinguals and the childhood bilinguals, they, they differ. Yeah. So for the childhood bilinguals, <clears throat> Uh, 47 is a stakan, um, but 50 is a bokal, um, and uh, for the early bilinguals, both of these are stakan. Yeah? So it seems that the early bilinguals are somehow influenced by their English categories that, okay, these things are called glasses, stakan corresponds to glass, so even if something is not a perfect stakan, we still call it a stakan. Um, here you see numeric results that indicates the, the, the correlation of naming similarities between different groups, and you see that there's a, a significant and large correlation between late bilinguals and the native Russians. So they still have the habits of naming things the good old Russian way. The childhood bilinguals, there the correlation is already weaker. And with the early bilinguals, the correlation is actually weaker still. Native English speakers 
expectedly, uh, they don't correlate very much with the native Russian speakers. So native speakers of English and Russian differ in the way they label uh, household items like drinking vessels. There are different categories that are influenced by different parameters. And the use of L2 English has an effect on how a drinking vessel is labeled in the L1. There's an assimilation towards English categories with your increased proficiency in English. And the effect is strongest for early bilinguals, somewhat weaker for childhood bilinguals, and weakest for late bilinguals. Summing up what we've discussed today, we talked about the critical period hypothesis. Uh, age of acquisition plays an important role, but there's no sharp cutoff date for lang learning languages. The mechanisms stay the same, but there are things that get in the way when you're an adult language learner. We talked about the less is more hypothesis, aspects of the young brain that make it easier to learn languages. We talked about learning the sounds of a second language and how this gets harder as you get older. However, full proficiency can still be reached by early childhood bilinguals who then sound like native speakers. And we talked about the mutual influence of L1 and L2, not only uh, with regard to transfer from the L1 to the L2, but even in the opposite direction. So even the L2 can have an effect on how speakers use their L1. Right, that was it for today. Um, I hope to see you again next time. Until then, au revoir. See you then.